Jason and I like to rap. <laughs> When I'm on my bike, I like to go <laughs> brat. That's so good. That's good. All right. Welcome back to Mini Biking Ain't Easy. I'm your host, Jason, with my producer, Zane. I got Bernie's on the one, twos, and threes. Yo, yo. And our special guest today, Mark Smith. Thanks, guys. So, Mark Smith, we know you from the Lime 100. Yeah. Which is a mini bike race. Correct. That just happened last week at the time of us of this recording. It did, yeah. So, let's go back even further. So, now we tied in why you are here because of the, the mini <laughs> yeah. bike race. You have got to fill me in with how it all started, why mini bikes, what are you doing now? Just kind of give me the rundown. All right. All right. So, how far do you want to go back? I mean, like, I can go way back. Okay. Well, let's start here. What, what's your first mini bike? Okay. Okay, so I never actually owned one. Grew up with a single mother. We were pretty poor, but my best friend next door had two tote goats. Nice. Like, yeah, they were they were they were pretty rough. Where, where um, is home? Yeah. Is, is it home in is Texas? home is Southern Oregon. Oh, okay. No, so I'm okay. from Southern Oregon originally. We'll talk about gambler and all that a little yeah. later. But two tote goats. One was uh a, like like a one and a half horse, unknown brand. Uh, rototiller motor and the other one was like a three and a half horse Tecumseh that was the fast one right Dude, that's nice. <laughs> the slow one that I got to ride all the time had the paddle brake you know <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> pushing against yeah. the top yeah it was it was pretty old yeah. school it had no suspension it was it was I mean it was rough yeah rough but yeah that was my first experience with minis so now mini bikes southern Oregon how long are you in Oregon for 19 years 19 years um, Born in Southern California, never really lived there. Grew, moved to Southern Oregon with my grandparents and with my family. And so, yeah, I grew up there. Everybody in Southern Oregon is kind of like like a roughneck, mm. right? A lot of lumberjacks, a lot of, uh, a lot of mechanics, you know, a lot of blue collar. You know, everybody's got minis and motorcycles and yeah. quads and whatever. So when do you make the move over to, over to Texas? Um, that We're talking quite a long ways. 19 years in or Oregon, then I joined the, the military. I was with the Army for seven years as a nice. paratrooper. Huh? Traveled kind of all huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, kind of traveled all over the place, all over the country. And uh, at the end of that seven-year period, I was stationed on Fort Lewis in Washington. Now Fort Lewis-McCord, you know, Joint Base Lewis-McCord. Mm. And um, I fell in love with it up there. I thought it was it was amazing, right? The mountains, the the water, the trees, the people were really cool. And I stayed there for 23 years. Nice. Then came Texas. Texas was about, well, 2020, end of 2020, COVID. Mm -hmm. Things were crazy. Washington went a little wild. Yeah. You know, things got a little nuts. And Texas was looking more and more appealing the longer we the longer we went. And so, yeah, we ended up in Texas, um, just southwest of Fort Worth, a little town called Joshua. And uh, we love it. It's great. That's crazy. So your job allowed you, or did you pick up a new job? Or? No, my job allowed me to. I've been with the same company for about 18 years as, as an enterprise sales rep for Global. Actually, I sell technology to, you know, Fortune 100 companies around the world. Oh, nice. So your job, you can do for, as long as you have a phone and, and a pretty computer. much, yeah. I mean, we, they want us to stay within a you know reasonable range of the office, but I go in about once a quarter, maybe twice a quarter. And is that back in Washington? No, I mean, I'm talking. We oh, sorry, we have a we have a corporate office here in Plano too. Oh, okay. So right. the the, the company is actually headquartered in Redmond, Washington. It's like the the other Washington IT company, and mm -hmm. you know next to Microsoft. So <laughs> <laughs> the other IT company in Redmond. Yeah. yeah. So in Oregon, so when I think of Oregon, I think of the Gambler. Yeah, I think of Tate absolutely. out there. Yep. So how did you come into the Gambler and the Tate family and great. all that? Yep, yep, great question. So 2018, actually it was 2017, um, I didn't get to attend the event, but my brother tells me, hey, man, you've got to check out this thing I saw on YouTube, this video, the video. I'm sure you've heard of it, right? Yeah. The video, <laughs> right? And, and I look at that, I was like, oh, my God, that, that's what I did as a kid. Like, we took junker cars, we drove them out in the woods, we hooned around, and, you know, we didn't call it that then, we called it, like, boonie hopping, yeah. right? That's what it was back then, you know? <laughs> nice. You know, but we're, 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 we're rolling around in the woods, and it didn't matter what kind of a car it was, right? It could be, like, a Dodge Dart Swinger, it could be a Pinto, it could be a pickup truck, I mean, mm -hmm. it could be anything. And we go out in the woods, you know, hopefully don't break down. If we did, we never had any tools with us. So it was always a matter of, like, how can we make this work, right? <laughs> yeah. And so when I saw this Gambler video, I was like... This is like, I mean, talk about reliving your youth, right? I mean, like perfect midlife crisis moment. It was fantastic. <laughs> so we went and, you know, I, I bought an old Pathfinder and we painted it. We didn't even do anything to it. We just painted it and ran it, nice. right? And uh, ran the first one. And I mean, it was like, there was no looking back for me. And I've been to countless events. I've hosted events. One event, my, well, now I'm partnered with Lone Star Gambler 500. So we host mm -hmm. uh, three events a year. 
right? Plus the mini bike races. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that's, that's gambler. Met Tate Morgan originally in Oregon, got to know him pretty well up there. We never really spent a lot of time in person together, but, but friends of friends, lots of coordination together, lots of conversations. But when I moved to Texas, there was, there were some holes. And so we ended up um, really coordinating together and communicating together to try to figure out kind of where I'd fit in this hole. And that's how I got together with my buddy Poncho Cole in the mm -hmm. Lone Star Gambler 500 group. Mm -hmm. So Gambler, for those who don't know, how I view it as is you just take a junker car, and I yeah. believe there's a course that's, you know, how many miles does it vary? So, so, so the, the kind of the high level is cheap car. Right, impractical car, crazy wild car. Doesn't there's no rule on how much it should cost. Yeah. Um, historically, it was a five hundred dollar car, kind of like a cheap truck yeah. challenge, right? Like you've seen on like Dirt Every Day and whatever. Yeah. Pretty much, there's no rules. You know, there, there's the number one rule. I don't know if we're PG here or not, but <laughs> there's the number one rule, right? Uh, don't be a you know, but uh, <laughs> but otherwise, um, otherwise, you know, there's really no rules. Make sure your car is registered and licensed and can run on public roads, including the National Forest roads and the state roads yeah. and whatever, right? But but pretty much try to hit 500 miles off road and while you're doing it, clean up trash, mm. right? In Oregon, you know, we don't see it so much in Texas. We've got a lot of private land and it's pretty well maintained, but in, in states like Washington, Oregon, Idaho, you know, places that have a lot of public land, we've got huge operations in like New York and in uh, Arkansas, uh, California, whatever. There's a lot of trash and the guys go out there and they pick up like, like thousands of pounds of trash at a time to the point that Gambler is responsible for collecting like millions of tons now, or I mean, millions of pounds rather of trash. I mean, like a, like a typical Oregon event will pull in like massive containers. I mean, like one, two, three, four, I mean, like these big long line of containers of trash. So it's really important to places where there is a lot of public land where people dump, you know, yeah. really helps out a lot. That's one of the things that I saw being at the Gambler. We went to mm -hmm. one two or three years ago, I think three years ago, and they yeah. brought in an old boat on a trailer yeah. and they used yeah. that as a they dumpster. They did, yep, yep, they did. But just the fact that you guys made it a, a, a point, you know, a number one point, clean it, make this place better than what you found it, I thought that yeah. was a beautiful Yeah, model. and you know, this whole this whole philosophy, it, 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 Tate will tell you it wasn't like his one-man show, right? It was him and several of his core friends. But the whole idea of stewardship, the whole idea of making it free yeah. and not like... Um, trying to uh, monetize it, not trying to make it into, like, you, you can use his logo, yeah. right? You can spin up an operation, a, a, a gambler event, pretty much anywhere in the world. He wants to know about it. He wants to make sure that you're you're kind of keeping in line, right? And he doesn't want you to make money off of it, yeah. which is totally fair, because, I mean, it's supposed to be, like, grassroots fun, you know, mm -hmm. cheap. In the end, we're doing good for the community yeah. while also having a hell of a good time off-road. Yeah, heck yeah. So the gambler, then, is it an endurance race? Like, is it usually... <laughs> It is what you make of it. Okay. I mean, we call it a na an off-road navigational challenge, right? But it's not a race, <laughs> right? Because, okay. I mean, racing on public roads is not legal, right? Yeah. So, you know, you go as far as you can off-road. Uh, some people never leave camp. I mean, let's. Oh, wow. uh, the truth is some people never leave camp, right? Just there to hang um, out. They're just there to hang out. Most people do. Most people go out and, and drive as far as they can. Yeah. And when they're out there, they see something on the side of the road. Half the time, these people are stopped picking up trash. Yeah. The other half the time, they're stopped because they're fixing their cars. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, um, I mean, it, it's, uh, it's, it's cheap, fun, and good for the environment. And I can see that going hand in hand with mini bikes because mini bikes are also relatively Absolutely. cheap. Yep. And Absolutely. I'd imagine if your truck breaks down and hopefully you have a mini bike back there and then yep. you have a way to get back to camp. I, you know, a lot of people do that. Um, you'll see a lot of the time you'll see minis mounted on trunks. Nice. Right. So uh, a very common car in gambler community is a Crown Vic, right? Yeah. Y you'd be shocked at how many times you see mini bikes, multiple even, <laughs> mounted on the on the yeah. trunk leaning up over the back of the oh car over the glass yeah and we've we've had yes we've had glass get broken out we've had roofs crushed you know yeah. but uh but ultimately you're right i mean being able to get around really quick sometimes they can find they can go down these little unknown trails and find these honey pots of just yeah. junk that you know and then they'll figure out how to get back there and haul it out yeah. you know we've had big military vehicles <laughs> we've had people on motorcycles oh, wow. that have done the whole event on a motorcycle. Wow. We've had people come from like the East Coast on a motorcycle, run the whole event, and then ride home. Oh my goodness. You know, it's so uh, so like yeah, blast. and yeah. and it is a blast. It, it's it's really fun, and uh, like I said, it's inexpensive. I mean, for me, it's kind of a lifestyle, and it, it's not as inexpensive as it was when I was just going to them. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, for the average person that wants to go to an event, you know, whether it's a gambler event, whether it's a mini event, we try to make them just, you know, affordable, fun, and 
you know, make sure you get something out of it. So everything you learned from Oregon, you then come to Texas. You said there were some some holes to fill. You're doing mini bike races. Yep. You're also doing the, you said the Lone Star Gambler yep. 500? Yep, so Lone Star Gambler 500 is a small group that's that's based out of Houston and Dallas now, mm-hmm. right? Two of us run it, and there's several people that are involved, kind of like the core, you know, core yeah. helpful group, right? We call them like the Gam Fam, you know, okay. the Gambler yeah. family, right? These people that, are, that's all they do, right? Yeah. They come out and they have fun. We run events in Oklahoma. We run Texas Carnado. Yeah, the premise is that, well, first of all, we couldn't find a place to do a North event in enough time so i have friends that actually operate a camp up there and uh it's out in the middle of nowhere and so we thought okay well you know tornadoes and texas and tornado alley so we're gonna have a carnado that rolls up through into oklahoma and that's how that happened but our our other events are in uh lano we've got an event down there um is the it's a biannual event so that's every two years and that one is typically you know 40 50 people it's not a gigantic event but the the town loves us right we go back there every year every couple years and then the last one and and probably the most uh interesting is gambler 500 mexico where we spend four days this year it's actually we're calling it uh um, uh, Revenge of Santa Ana or Santa Ana's Revenge, right? Oh, nice. That's going to be down in Terlingua, Texas, right next to Big Bend National okay. Park. If if you've never been there before, Terlingua is like nothing else in the world. I hear it's, it's beautiful. It's shockingly Are there mountains down there? Tons of mountains. Which is, in Texas. Which volcanoes. Wow. Like extinct okay, volcanoes that. that used to be on an ocean floor. I mean, like, nice. it's incredible. Um, not not only that, but it's literally right on the border with Mexico. You know, you've got the Rio Grande River. Yeah. You've got Santa Elena, Elena's Canyon. You know, all these all these great sights to see. And then when you go across the river into either any any number of border crossings, right, um, you get to see what, what it's like in Mexico and what that lifestyle is like down there. And, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a different world. It definitely feels really cool going over there and helping not only to try to help clean up some trash, but just, you know, be a part of the economy and visit yeah. with the people down there. So, yeah, we've had some really good experiences. Nice. So those are the, the car races. Correct. Or, uh, gamblers. So how many mini bike races do you do yep. here? So this is our second one, the one that we just ran. So that's the second Lime 100. We have on the schedule a tentative Lime 100 South, potentially down in the you know San Antonio, San Marcos type of area, Hondo type area. We've got a couple options down there for places where we may be able to uh, run another race. And then um, another group that's loosely affiliated. They're not they're not part of us yet, but we're we're talking to them as running uh, Cinco de, Cinco de Minis. Nice. Down in uh, down in that same area in May. Okay. So hey, we've had a lot of conversations with them about how that might you know that might work out and how we might be able to partner on that. So nice. it's really early, nothing official yet. Yeah. Um, some of those guys were at the Lime 100 this weekend. They were okay. the guys from Alamo City Gamblers. Oh, nice. Right. So pretty great, cr- great crew. Um, funny. Yeah. <laughs> you know, good guys, and you know they're really excited about doing that event. Now, why the name Lime 100? Oh, good question. So Lime is in and. I'm not usually good at acronyms, but <laughs> but Lime is Lone Star Invitational Mini Enduro. Okay, now it's funny because that came after I thought I thought about some of the great races, right? We've got the Mint. It's happening right now, okay. right? We've got the Mint 400. We've got the 24 Hours of Lemons, right? Yeah. Which kind of ties into the whole yeah. junk car kind of gambler type thing, right? And I'm like, so so what do we call it? Like like what would be funny, right? And I'm thinking oranges, and I'm thinking like. <laughs> bubble gum or yeah. whatever and then i'm like wait a minute lone star you know and it, and it just like yeah. it just came out that it was the lime 100 okay right? that totally makes yep, sense yeah so originally that was supposed to be 100 laps and okay. and, and it pretty much was the first race was a third of a mile okay it's not impossible so to do 100 so laps in a third really, of a mile right yeah. when we changed it this year to like a 1.3 miles we're like well we're gonna have to change that dynamic a little bit or we're gonna yeah. be here all day yeah. i mean longer than all day so so we changed it to a 100 minute race Okay. And so last uh, weekend, would you mm-hmm. say that was successful? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was fantastic. How many people do you think you had out so there? So we had 40 racers registered. We actually had 41, but one was underage. And we, we, we made the, we, we called it out in the beginning, 18 plus, right? Okay. Um, he did get to race the track. He just yeah. didn't get to compete. But So that was great. Um, but 40 actual racers who showed up. And of those racers, you know, it was it was a pretty successful event. We had one injury. We did this time. Um, and and yeah, um, luckily he's okay. Broken collarbone. Oh, just, where's just Taylor? Like Taylor? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, where's Taylor? Um, um, and he did have to go to the hospital. They had to go out oh. in an ambulance. He was totally cool about it. His family was great about it. The the the, the owner of the park knew everybody. The EMS mm-hmm. workers. I mean, it was just. It was fantastic. We got everybody off the track. We were as helpful as we could be. And when they were done, they're like, "You guys are all good." 
So we continued. Wow. And um, no other injuries the whole day. Good. Um, some breakdowns. Yeah. Whew. That was a rough track. <laughs> so <laughs> I had this amazing track. You guys maybe saw the video that I did. Like, like I had this track that was yeah. like 1.3 miles. It had a couple little difficulties. It wasn't that bad. It rained. <laughs> oh, no. We had to change the whole track last minute. Like we got to do ver the very beginning, but yeah. that was it. Um, but ultimately, it turned out really good. And we and we also tested the first live real world test of our new timing system. Okay. So we have an RFID timing system that gives real time times mm -hmm. for every rider that goes by, and it doesn't really matter how many riders go by at once; it gets them all right. Because so, there's a tracker be, on them. Or yeah. Something? So they have so. A lot of the a lot of the races run transponders, and transponders are great, but they're really expensive to the rider. The rider will typically, if if you're forced to buy the transponder, I mean, that could be hundred bucks, two hundred bucks. I mean, yeah. it's like that, right? And they're not all intercompatible yeah. with all the other systems. So I wanted to make something that would be cheap, relatively reliable in comparison to like, you know, or writing <laughs> you know writing down <laughs> numbers. And and so it, it was actually a huge success. We did have a problem where one racer just for some reason. He was not getting captured, and I don't know if the tag was mm -hmm. had a bad signal or whatever. He was really understanding. Yeah. First try, you know, I warned everybody in advance. You know, we might run into some issues, but other than that, other than that, I mean, like like everybody was getting their times regularly. We had some growing pains to work out, but I think next time it'll be really on the ball. Okay, so we have so the race just happened. Your one of your sponsors, you got Coleman, right? I did. Yeah. Is Coleman? Uh, do they do everything the mini bike, or is it just gambler stuff? Like, how is the affiliate? How are you guys affiliated with Coleman? So we aren't we aren't affiliated, okay. but they have been a sponsor for numerous gambler events, right? Okay. So Coleman Power Sports, I got to meet with Ron and Jen. Great people. Actually, they just opened a facility just down the road. Yeah. Um, on the other side of Dallas, I got to go into the facility, and it's. They got room for some bikes. Nice. <laughs> it's big. Nice. Um, they have sponsored gambler events historically for quite a while. Um, Tate put me in contact with them, and and they were just, I mean, they were excited just to get their name out there. They were looking for, you know, get into the their tagged on videos, tagged on content. You know, it's it's really important to them, just like it is for Go Power Sports and any other, you know, any other company that's really looking for that, you know, that social influence. Yeah. Our biggest thing is that there's our bandwidth is so small, so anyone who can throw on races such as yourself. Yeah. We just want to be associated associated with anything go kart, mini bike related. So the fact that you and Coleman would go do all the hard work for us, we appreciate yeah. you. Hey, you know what? Do. You know what? You guys were great, right? You show up with great prizes. Nice. You show up with Bernie and yeah. and the guys there. You know, getting great content yeah. and and just you know like like raising the the excitement level, Good. right? It was really cool, and and I got a lot of positive feedback from the racers too. There's a lot of racers that really think highly of GPS, and having oh. you guys there was important. So yeah, appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. We don't want to exclude anybody. Anyone who is on it uh, on a mini bike, we want to support them. We yeah, we have a great uh, relationship with Coleman as well. Yep. So I'm glad to see this work. Uh, so first, let's take a quick break. Okay. We're gonna hear from a few words from our sponsors, and we'll be right back. So you've been talking about getting new tires. Well, now's the time. These 16 by 6 8 V tread tires are on all black 8 inch floater wheels and are perfect for Trailmaster Mid, Blazer 200R, and Hammerhead ADT go karts. And right now we're having a limited time closeout deal on these go kart tires $99 for a left and a right. That's two tires for $99. Let's go to a scientist and get the math on that. It's a great deal. You can get yours at. Oh. You can go get yours now at www.gopowersports.com or if you're on YouTube, click the link up above. And we're back. So, Mark, uh, I'm curious, what are your what are your most interesting or vivid experiences that you've had that you've seen running races and that you've had happen to you at okay. a race? OK, first, let me talk about foot pegs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so both Lime races, there has been a pretty burly dude on a pretty big bike that had a foot peg break. Um, the first one was Mitch Pittman. Um, Mitch Pittman was wearing a, a great big old onesie and riding the race. And he was, Mitch is a big dude on a big, fast bike, right? And uh, so he rides the almost the whole race. And then he hits the end. He was one of the, I mean, I didn't let anybody ride in the, that final dash for cash if they didn't finish the race, right? So he finished the race limping along. 
At the very end, I'm like, dude, you got to ride the Dash for Cash. You have to, right? Wait, so what's the Dash for Cash? Okay, so last time we did not have sponsored prizes. Oh, so what I did okay. was I took race funds, the, the race fees, and I turned around and I gave it back to the racers, right? Which was great. This time I couldn't do that because I was paying for an extremely expensive new timing system. <laughs> not as expensive as 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 the the um, you know the transponders, but still you know relatively expensive. So that's where great sponsors like JPS and Coleman came <laughs> yeah. in and really made that happen. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so that was last year. Then this year, our friend Andrew Porter had the same problem happen. He he actually rode hardtail. First, his hardtail bike broke, I mean, a couple laps in, and he asked me, he's like, you know, GPS is willing to let me ride their bike. Can I ride soft tail? I'm like, you know, that's fine. I would have done that for anybody that wanted to ride another race. That would have yeah. been fine. Um, he was the only one that asked. <laughs> so, so he gets about five laps in, five laps in, and there goes his foot peg. Oh. <laughs> he rides the entire race, by the way, the entire race, and comes in third nice. with wow. no foot peg. So, so that was a big one. We've had spills, we've had breakdowns. Um, we've had guys that were, were just ripping it like, like David Rogers this time his, he had a catastrophic failure on his bike, mm. um, ended up riding the entire race w knowing only that up until the very last lap of the race, the very last lap, he had the best lap time of the day. Oh, wow. He lost it to Carl Tech in the very last lap by about a half a second. Oh, he might sound familiar because wow. he won the uh, the 180, I, I believe. Oh. The the guy, Carl, won the, the 180. Oh, yeah, wow. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. He got fastest time at the, nice. at the line. Nice. And I don't have it in front of me, but I'm pretty sure. Yeah, he got second place in the soft tail, but, you know, outlaw class But he would have been. Would have been well, for, well, no, no. So, would so, have had the best time. So, David, yes, would have had the best time. I, I don't know if if you guys have seen his bike. It's he comes no. in here, yeah, quite a lot. I have. It, it's sick. Okay. okay, like it's a beast, right? <laughs> we'll and and yeah, unfortunately, we'll uh, unfortunately, the first thing that happened was he he had a problem with his clutch. I don't remember if he broke a belt or what it was, and he was he was really disappointed because he, I mean he was he was doing really good. I, I convinced him to keep riding. I was like, listen. You have by far the best lap time right now. And if you finish the race, I don't care how many laps you do. If you finish the race, I'll let you qualify for best lap time of the day, which was one of the GPS prizes, right? Yeah. I think that was maybe the Tillotson. Nice. No, no, a juggernaut, maybe. Uh, whatever. It was It was one of the prizes, right? It sounds like he could have used a juggernaut. And he could have. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. So he rode the entire race even after breaking his frame, which happened next. Jeez. Yeah, so so he rode the entire race and literally, I mean, those guys hit, I don't have it in front of me, 35, I think, laps, total laps, and the last lap of the day was the one that beat his time. Oh. So it was that close, man. I, I like I was rooting for him to win that, yeah. that you know. He's so. riding the, the black yep. knight of a bike, just yeah. like everything's <laughs> falling off of Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And then, and then uh, uh, so as far as what's happened to me as a race director and coordinator, so I came in last year with this idea. Okay, we'll run all classes on the track at the same time. <laughs> uh, people wanted to get it done fast. They want to go early. Yeah. I, I, I threw that out the window this year. That was not going to happen. So I came out with this new platform that I've never used before, that I had never really tested before, other than to kind of set it up and see if it worked. Yeah. Right. And it was a push button thing where you get the names on there, and it's it's great. It's called Web Score. It's a great platform. Okay. That's what I used this year with the timing with the ID RFIDs worked beautifully for that. But trying to touch a screen, right? While there's and by the way, we sat on the wrong side of the track, and um, Bernie was there. He saw it. Like our volunteers were like they looked like coal miners. You know what I mean? Like they were so coated from head to toe in dirt. <laughs> well, the laptop stopped working. We were doing all right at first, right? We were doing all right. It was, yeah, we, maybe it wasn't perfect, but it was, it was at least equally as good as somebody checking themselves in, right? Yeah. But then the next group came out because we had them on the track at the same time. And then all of a sudden, all chaos. And then the tablet stopped working or the laptop oh, stopped working. Oh. And then, you know, the PA system stopped working. Everything, just the dust, just, you know. It so gets into everything. this year we're like, okay, we're doing this differently. It's not going to be this way. And so we spread it out to where each category, each class had 100 minutes on the track. And then we gave a half an hour in between. Yeah, it makes it an all-day event, but that way it was safer. There weren't as many injuries. There weren't as many crashes. And um, ultimately, we didn't have any system failures at all. Nice. Okay. Yeah. 
That's awesome. It sounds like the system's working out pretty well. I was really impressed. <laughs> yeah, I was really, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's totally DIY. Right. Okay. I, I, I joined like the Facebook timing systems group, you know, and I was listening to what everybody was saying and they're like, this one costs 5,000. This one costs 2,500 a day. This one. Co-, and I'm like, these are like huge numbers. These are not motors. Well, these aren't like, like they're talking about doing bike races, like, like cycling races with yeah. like 500 contestants. Right. And, and, you know, when you have that many, you can pool those funds so that you can afford to, you know, pay for a little bit more expensive system like a rental yeah have some timing company come out but for mini bike racing it's just not it's not doable it's not affordable right so the idea was build this system that works yeah even if it's not exactly perfect at least everybody has the same chance of having a failure right yeah so every, and i told i told the writers that in the beginning they laughed they thought it was great they're like whatever it's cool we just want to race right and so in the end aside from like i said one racer did not get counted he was cool with it. Yeah. One racer got counted the entire time, but it didn't link to his name. We knew who it was, and we tracked it the whole time, right? So we've got all the lap times. We've got the total count of laps. And then when we went to export it, it dumped it. It's gone. Oh, so no. we don't have his times. We know he won. He was the lap leader the whole time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the whole time. We know that, that he won, right? Yeah. So Seth Price, he he won uh, stock. And, and it, like, by the way... He, like, like it was obvious. Everybody's like, he, he's there's killing. no one who's yeah. gonna be like, yeah. no, yeah. no, yeah, no. It was obvious, right? So it was, it was cool. And none of the racers complained. You know, it was really. It, last year we had some concerns, right? We did. So, okay. so if that's all that this accomplished was alleviating concerns and giving somebody the ability to look online and say, yeah, you know what, I did that. Yeah. Then I'm happy with it. And that's cool too, because then also people can people like track their scores then or track so their times. So eventually we're going to get to that point. Right okay. now I did post the times online, but I did it in Excel. There were some challenges with the system double tallying laps. Okay. Uh, that won't happen again. We know why it happened, and and we can avoid it. But because of that, um, it wasn't that we couldn't tell what they were. I mean, they were like three seconds, five seconds. Obviously, they weren't doing a lap in yeah. that time. So so we had to cut them out. But there's not really a way to import those back into that system. So next year, we're hoping that we can just, like, it'll be even, maybe even live results. It'll depend on on internet connections and such, right? Yeah. But maybe even live results. So we should be able to post that up to that platform. I'll continue to pay for it. It's it, Those guys are really good. They're actually out of Washington, where I'm from, right down the road. So, nice. so they do a good job. Okay, cool. Did you meet them? Did you meet them through one of these DIY groups? Or you did know, you meet um, them through your work as a... No, um, I looked online for race scoring <laughs> systems and I found them and they were, they seem to be a pretty prominent company and then they give you some ideas about how you can build these systems and such. So I didn't build it exactly the way they asked, you know, way, the way they specified, but I mean, in the end, it got the job done, yeah. you know? So basically we just put a tag right on the front of their helmets oh, and okay. they hit the, it, with the two antennas kind of in an angle like this, everybody pretty much, I mean, like, it was pretty much like clockwork. Every time they hit a certain point, you know, and and they were getting caught. I mean, depending on exactly where they were on the track, they might have had like they they say there there could be a half a second variation. Okay. You know, based on that. But I mean, like we were watching, it was like boom, 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 hitting those hitting. You're those watching up. the numbers pop. Yeah, we we're watching it happen. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So okay. so um, you know, we tried initially having a aim at each other. That wasn't working so out. So we just kind of you know and we did, in testing. Yeah. yeah. Just overlapping fields yep. of fire. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And we figure you know most of the people are hitting about the same spot. We saw it. Every time they're like right in the middle. Yeah. Right? Every time. And, and there were very few times, surprisingly, where there were like two or three people crossing at the same time. It was always in a line. Oh. Unlike the last time, Bernie remembers, man, there'd be like six or seven people like right next to each other. Yeah. <laughs> and we're like, how do we possibly, uh, you know, like score that? Yeah. You know, so all we had, to, what we ended up doing last time was just watch the lap leader, make sure they stay the lap leader, and yeah. if they did, then they won. But that's why we did the dash for cash at the end. We wanted to make sure it was fair so that everybody that was still, if they were still on the track, then they got the same exact option to be able to win cash. Yeah, Yeah. okay. And that's where Taylor broke his collarbone. On the dash? Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Man, I didn't even with, know uh, that. Dave Rogers. Him was it? Dave yep. The last two. Yep. Dave was a winner. Andrew Porter was a winner. And I believe Chris Choncho was the other winner there. So okay. Chris Choncho is a gambler buddy that came down. He runs Oklahoma Gambler 500, so oh, the okay, Okie nice. Gambler 500. Yeah, so it, we, were, we were proud of him. He actually got third place this time, too. Whoa. We were surprised. Yeah, third okay. place in stock this time. Yep, yep. Okay. So he's a hard charger, he's, man. He's, well, he's, he's a third place contestant. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can tease Choncho. He's my buddy. I love him. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, shout out to the best third place racer. The, there he is, is the best <laughs> third place racer, man, and I love him. He's fantastic. Awesome, man. What advice do you have for people who are considering starting an event sure. or want to organize an event? What advice do you have for them? Start by making sure that you have racers that want to go. Hmm. Don't set your schedule in advance. Okay. Okay. I made that mistake. No. Uh, Jason knows we had an overlap in potential events, and I'm so, no problem. I'll do it in a, at, a, at a different time, but it did set me back about six months, right? So make sure you know who's racing when, um, and then find sponsors. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, no. Actually, what, what it really comes down to is the biggest thing that, that made these two events successful were the volunteers. Mm. The first time I had a handful of volunteers, and the truth is a lot of them didn't show up. And then I had the diehards that were there at the race already who who stepped forward and helped out. This time we scheduled volunteers well in advance. They were from a pool of people. I, like I had, I, There's a, a free system that I found that would allow me to capture volunteers. They put their names down. They they said when they'd be there, what hours they'd be there, and that really helped a lot. Um, we, we had radios. I mean, we make sure you have radios. That's a big one. You got to be able to talk to your, your, uh, your checkpoints and your corners. Depending on where the race is, um, EMS on staff and on site is is pretty important. Um, Sounds like it. Yeah. Um, you, I mean, it's many bikes, right? So there are typically not as many injuries as there are in, like, motocross or in high-speed racing. But, but you know, I mean, it's always a possibility. So, um, you know, finding a way to have somebody at least close on standby. In this scenario, we knew that they were on standby within about 10 minutes. It took about 10 minutes from the call for them to get there, which was fine. So it wasn't like we were sitting there waiting all day for them to show up. <laughs> But the hospital is a ways away from that location, and we, you know, you got to take care of people. So, I knew in advance we had certain people who had uh, first aid and had been first responders. Um, what I didn't know that was that we had an RN there for the second year. <laughs> Ashley was there, and and uh, for the second year was able to help somebody, and it was really, you know, really cool. So, so make friends with registered nurses. Yes, is make what friends we're with first responders, <laughs> EMS, registered nurses. Um, you know, and, and also the, the last piece is, you know, don't be afraid to ask for help, not just from volunteers, but like John Russell comes out and takes photographs and video and some of the, some of the photography, I know you guys have seen some of it before the photography he does is spectacular mm. he doesn't ask for anything. Just, just say that it's mine. Right. And I appreciate that. That's really, that's really great. He'll come out on his motorcycle with his GoPros and his drones and he's running all over the place and like, he doesn't ask for anything. Just, you know, I just want to be there. He just you know, likes he just being a part it. of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so, uh, you know, between that and, you know, guys coming in and bringing in food and water. And I mean, like, this is all like just people that volunteer to do it. Um, I guess, you know, make friends with those people. <laughs> it's important, right? <laughs> make you, friends. Yeah. You, yeah. Make friends, <laughs> be, you know, be personable. And, and last, don't be afraid to spend a little bit of money. You have to. Okay. Right? Don't go into this thinking you're not going to spend a penny on it because you have to. It doesn't have to break you. It doesn't have to be like a like a major commitment, but you got to be able to buy the equipment that you need mm -hmm. and you have to be able to make sure that your racers are getting the experience that they want or they won't come back. Yeah. So I'm wondering about growth of this since you we are talking about one event. Yeah. Like when I hear growth, I think of it like It'd be awesome if it would kind of be like Formula One to where you can have multiple events and then you pull all those points for the year and you have a yep. year-long winner. Where do you see growth? Do you think this is possible? What, what's it's, in your head? Yep, so it, so it is possible. Um, what it's going to take is additional groups. So so one thing that I've learned from our friend Tate Morgan is that it takes a lot of people to make this stuff happen, right? Yeah. And being able to pull together people in different states to be able to help, right? And because we're going to use a timing system, that is not free, right? That takes some investment. I, I need to make sure that there's people in other states that have that, that type of interest, mm -hmm. not just people that run off road parks and that have properties because those are great and we need those, but we also need somebody that can say, hey, you know what? I can do the same thing, mm -hmm. right? And I can replicate that. And then that's how you make a series, right? This isn't something where the coordinators and directors are ever gonna get mo make money off of yeah. this, right? You don't get rich off of this. It yeah. takes some commitment. It, you, you might get your money back, Right. It's it's not going to be a business, at least, yeah. you know, not in the beginning. Right. Maybe someday down the road. Right. Yeah. But uh, for the most part, you know, that that's the idea. I have been talking to coordinators in other states and I've been talking to people that own different properties in other states. Um, also have uh, the backing of uh, the Gambler 500 group. You know, we've communicated plenty of times on this. They love mm -hmm. the idea, you know, whether or not this would be eventually tied with them or whether this would remain a separate 
group is not clear yet, yeah. but there's options. As far as a series go, I mean, let's start with North and South. Yeah. You know, and uh, we'll, we'll pull in the, the numbers with the same systems. And so, and then maybe we'll have like a annual like shootout with the, just the winners. You know, something like that, so mm-hmm. that they get another opportunity. You know, they, nothing. That's not. That's not for sure yet. But mm-hmm. we'll. You know, we'll consider anything. Something to think about. Yep. And I'm also curious about your tracking system because at the Go Power Sports 180, mm-hmm. we all hop off the bike, we run to a red card and run yep. it down. Yeah, yeah. It's tried and true, and there's no breakdown. But Correct. What a hassle to at the end of the race count 50, 60 scorecards and sure. make sure everyone's on sure. the up and up. So. Can you tell us? Yeah. <laughs> Will you after the show? Can you give me a? Oh, I can. A, I can share some details with you. I got no okay. problem sharing what I did. One thing I can tell you, it did make timing yeah. infinitely easier. Yeah. I mean, you, at the event, I was able to walk away from the timing station. That's nice. And say, okay, I know I've got another fifteen minutes. I was able to go up on the hills, mm-hmm. and get some pictures, and talk to some people, and you know that were that were spectators, and so it was really cool. And and the big thing, so like, there's now. Well, the, the, the largest, mini, longest, rather, time-wise, mini bike race in the nation is run, well, he just he just passed it off, but a friend of mine named Chris Hayes out of Florida was running 24 hours of lay minis, yeah. right? He, he just passed that off to our, our buddy Andrew, and Andrew's working on that. Now, I also heard word that somebody here in Texas is about to do 25 hours of Texas or something like that oh so that they can say that they have the longest <laughs> mini bike race in America. You oh can't check in. You can't <laughs> check in. Getting yeah. off and on and off the bike, I mean, that's yeah. hard enough as it is. And they, these are team races, yeah. right? And I don't know if they're allowing multiple bikes or not, but, you know, this is like a team event, right? Yeah. But but having just imagine being the people that have to time those laps <sighs> or count those laps so having a system yeah. like that would be huge for for an event like yours you guys get a great turnout um you know being able to just you know slap that thing on their helmet and mm-hmm. say okay you're good you know that would make a big difference for you i'm gonna look into that because you would save us weeks of preparation yeah hours of headache after the race yep okay well thank you for, <laughs> for <laughs> no i'm happy that. to share and i would share with anybody in the community because yeah. like i said i'm this for me isn't a this isn't a money maker this is a this is a hobby yeah. right i'd like to get back at some point or another what i invested into it that would be great yeah. right but but um i went into this you know eyes wide open knowing that this was this is something i do for fun Okay, and that's a running theme too. We had um we had Jeb Trioni on mm-hmm. uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he was talking about how it really is a labor of love. Like oh, you yeah. have to really yeah. enjoy it this is. kind of it thing, is. and and seeing the community come out. That's the that's the payoff. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, I, I love minis, right? I have minis, but I'm not a racer. Yeah, not not. I'm a coordinator. That's what I do, <laughs> right? I I never had time to race because of all the coordination I've done, and you know, so so I I lo- I mean, I went out there initially did about seven or eight laps on the track it was great i went out there the day before the race and was out there for like five hours riding the track so i love to ride um i'm not as competitive on the track as some of the people are but i love to make it so that they can be yeah and that they can excel and they don't have to worry about every little piece what they need to worry about is be there run to the bike (laughs) make sure it starts and run as many laps as you can that's my goal okay so they can just focus right on that that's it just race do you think that your coordination skills were developed in the military or is this something you've developed because of this uh, r- race series? Question. Yeah. So, so I would say early coordination skills and leadership skills did come from the military. Um, I left the military when I was 26. So okay, gotcha. I'm 47 now. It's been a little while. <laughs> um, I'd say that, that, uh, my job and what I do, you know, my family, raising a family <laughs> and I, I, I like I, we haven't talked about this but I've got three kids right one's uh just 28 what year is it yeah 28 uh one is uh I have to think about that uh one's 23 and one's 10 so like I've been a dad with a kid in the house since I was 19 years old man you are really running like, it never goes away there, man. man it's like when do I get a break <laughs> no I'm kidding I love my kids <laughs> but it but it means you know I have to be I have to be a leader at home I have to be a leader at work and and so yeah. um you know and in my job uh, we don't like to use the term individual contributor because I'm not a manager and I'm not a director, but in my job, I do lead teams regularly in the acquisition of new business, in the development of new business and, and building out new solutions and projects and et cetera, et cetera. Right. So I have to kind of be the figurehead for that whole thing. And so, yeah, it's had an impact for sure. Okay. Gotcha. All right. 
with that, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back after these messages from our sponsors. Whoa. Hey, Jason. Everything good? You want us to come back, man, or? How? I'm trying to get these people to figure out how good of a deal this Rascal Light is. Well, you, you tell them it's a super cost-effective kit. Plus, it's a complete mini bike for under 500. Yeah, da, 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 da. I want these people to feel this deal. A deal. A great deal. Hey, maybe we should go get some fresh air. Yeah, go get some fresh air. Okay. Any ideas yet? So, what do we think? Your first point was uh, make sure that you don't overlap and we have our scheduling down. Yeah. I feel like we should, uh, I, I want to paint my side of the picture and I want to hear your side because you're going to help me connect the dots here. I love that. So we're on Go Power Sports number three coming up right. this year. Yeah. But two years ago is when we first had the idea of like, oh, we should really get this started. Absolutely. Two years before that is when we were out in Oregon doing Tate's yep. race. Yep. So Tate really instilled it in us. We went out, had a blast at the event, had all our YouTubers totally. out there. Yeah. It was a great time. Went back the second time, COVID hit. There wasn't much of a race, so it was yep. more just hanging out in Oregon. Beautiful place to hang oh, out. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Um, and then the third, we were like, well, we don't want to drive all the way to Oregon anymore. Maybe we can piggyback onto an organization yep. that can do a gambler here in Texas. Sure, sure. That's when I first met That's you. when we first talked, yep, yep. And so I put a post out there like, hey, does anyone want to do a gambler in Texas? If so, I just I just want to put my name on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys came up with NTX. Yeah, we did, yeah. Um, and said, hey, yeah, we can we can help run this. You yep. were gun ho about it. I was like, oh, okay, cool. My bandwidth is, o is overflow with. Yeah. Mark's going to run with this. So that backside, how we started with you guys, mm -hmm. you guys then proposed that we do this at at a race venue. We did, yeah. Which, when we we had some of our customers come out, they went to a few races, came back and said, "Man, the owner of this track uh, just tried to fight everybody, picked up his prizes, and just went." <clears throat> and we're like, well, "Oh, man, wow. we want this to be a family fun event." I don't know if we could associate ourselves with that. So then one of our guys, Paul, who is our engine builder, said, I've never done a race, but let me have a crack at it. Sure. And so we kind of, and we I should have been a better communicator, but everything was just up in the air. Our guy, Paul, is like, yeah, let's find a spot, and I'll run it. I'll find an EMS. I'll find everything Absolutely, for yeah. us. Yeah. And then so we're like, okay. And so he found a spot. The spots that we have races here and here. You only have this this weekend in November to do it. Yeah. Like okay, book it. And then we then we stomped on a few toes. It happened. Yeah. 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 Of course. Of course. Yeah. And you know, um, I didn't have any hard feelings over that. Okay. I didn't at all. Um, in fact, the the truth is, I felt like I was a little behind the curve. And when that happened, I was ready to just push out. 
right? Yeah. I didn't feel, I, I was having my questions about the venue too, mm -hmm. right? And, and I mean, you know, no hard feelings with them either, but it, was, yeah. it just wasn't working, right? Yeah. They had some ideas that, did, that didn't quite align with what I was looking for. And so that's when yeah, I went to uh, Hoopty Cross. Hoopty Cross is a, a kind of a spinoff from Gambler, right? Cheap cars, go out to the track. There are rules. It's racing, yeah. right? Um, um, Chuck Brazier, who runs Hoopty Cross, is at the Mint 400 right now with a bunch of gamblers. Nice. And in the new Mint, Mint 400 Hoopty Cross class, mm -hmm. by the way. So it's an official uh, Mint 400 class nice. now. Yeah. So point is, they had run Hoopty Cross at Blake's Place in, in Oklahoma at Redneck Off-Road Heaven, mm -hmm. right? And so that's how I got to meet the North Texas Rally Cross team. Okay. Austin and Blanton and those guys were really down to the, you know, with the idea of, of let's get together and let's do a race day, right? We'll have rally cross, we'll have mini bikes, we'll do, maybe, maybe we'll have other things come out, right? Nice. And so we were able to push that out to March. We had a great event, you know, the, the NTX team was there, the, the Demon City team was there, the Alamo City team was there. We had mini bike riders from all over the place, people from Tomb, people from Texas mini bikes. They were the, from all over the place. And we had like 47 riders that first year, which uh, I honestly didn't expect. That's quite a bit. I, it was, it was quite a bit for a first year, yeah. And, um, yeah, it went to hell. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, right? It was it was a real challenge, but I think yeah. everybody got enough of a taste of it yeah. to say, okay, we're going to give that another shot because these people care about what they're doing, and that's that's really it. Obviously, you guys care about the race. Yeah, you care about putting it on, and you're not putting it on because you're trying to, you know, you're trying to take advantage of racers. You're putting it yeah. on because you want to give them the opportunity yeah. to experience it. That's it, yeah. right? And and it's fun. So. I'll be there this year for sure. Okay, yeah. Probably won't be racing. You won't be? Um, uh, yeah, it's all right. You can come not. hang out. But I'll come hang out, yeah. you know. I won't be racing. I'll probably be taking photos with Bernie anyway. So you can Just bring your timing us. system. <laughs> oh, bring, bring the timing system. All right, all right. We can, we can talk about that. <laughs> so unfortunately, there's still some bad blood in, in uh, people's mouths. Seems, and, yeah, it seems like it. Um, and I want to formally apologize to anyone because not our heart. It just kind of way the chips fell. Yeah. I could have been a better communicator for sure. But hopefully we can get this up and going because I think for us to be able to grow the sport, we kind of kind of put this aside and hopefully have different series, different race coordinators, and maybe we can pull up all of our points from all of our different races. And I would love to do it because I would love to do like a drive to survive follow the team and that do like a, cool. a full netflix series of this yep. but on mini bikes how, how dope that would, that would be? be fantastic so we just need to all hug it out so everyone, yeah <laughs> come on come on down I'll, I'll give you one free hug can we yeah. can we do an event where we just anyone who has beef with us can drive up to the ranch and we literally just have a giant stump and people can bury a hatchet <laughs> i love that that's fantastic <laughs> Well, just yeah, clear the air with everybody. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah. Oh, that's all. I just Absolutely. wanted to jump in with a silly thing. You know, just just one th one comment on that. Um, I think most people who really know me, I'm like super transparent. I'm a straight shooter, right? And um, if if I ever say something, don't ever read into it. Yeah. Don't because I say what I mean, like yeah. like exactly what I mean. So if if uh, you know if people have have read into it, just go back and look what I said. Yeah. That's all I'd ask, right? So. Yeah, I mean, I, I love being here in Texas. I love the racers. I love the environment. I love dealing with companies like GPS and Coleman. And, you know, that gambler spirit is don't be a, you know, exactly. <laughs> right? Exactly. I believe it. I yeah. mean, like, like I've learned so much from from Tate now over the past several years and that whole, uh, you know, the, the idea of just just be cool. Yeah. Just have a good time, you know, and um, and do good things while you're at it. Yeah, part of being a uh, laid back Texan, I guess, as long as you're on a mini bike, you're kind of family. Like you're, <laughs> yeah. you're cool because you're on two bikes, whether you yeah, bought it yeah. from me or from someone else. I do not care. Doesn't matter. Just come hang out. We have something in common. So sure, sure. That's been a common theme with everyone we've been talking to. They just want the community to really survive. Absolutely, absolutely. And that was kind of my whole idea when I came down when I first talked with you was the idea that I saw these races happen, and every one of them had different rules. And every one of them had different structures. And it's it's fine, but I mean, like, especially when you have different tracks with different transponder yeah. systems and the racers are like, I got to buy one for this event or this event, or am I going to be able to get one? Did I get registered in time? Yeah. How, how come this race is $100 when this one is 10 or free? You know, I mean, and it, there was a lot of diversity. So, so my thought was at least get together with these other racing groups yeah. and, and try to come up with at least maybe a standard set of rules, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So that it's not just a bunch of guys riding kid toys yeah. and now it's maybe something a little more 
I mean, it's never going to be serious. Yeah. It's fun, right? But, yeah. but you know, something that a little more structured, right? And that's what I was hoping for. So the work that we've done together is really appreciated. So what's a, so? how do you make next year's Lime 100 even bigger? Yeah, so first off, everybody knows now that the scoring works. Yes. Right? That's a big deal. There were racers that did not come out this year specifically because of the way the mm. results happened last year, right? I knew it was going to happen. You know, I, I gave them as much reassurance as I could, um, but I got really good feedback, um, even from some of the people that, you know, I'm not talking to as much right now about, you know, racers want to race. They want prizes. They don't want cash. Yeah. That's what I heard from a lot of people. They don't want cash. They want prizes. Hmm. So we built nine trophies this year. Nice. I mean, nine trophies plus four really, really nice uh, sponsored prizes, Heck right? Yeah. My buddy Poncho Cole is down there in Houston, I swear. He's a full-time mechanic. I don't know when he finds time to build all these trophies, yeah. but, I mean, nine trophies plus uh, plus one for GPS, yeah. right? So ten trophies for this event. And that was after we just had an event two weeks prior where he gave away six. Oh, wow. So, so he's been busy like, I'm thinking this guy's like a full-time trophy maker. <laughs> 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 but, uh, but yeah, so so we heard we heard those two, two feedback. You know, we want a really good timing system. And they don't want to get off the bikes. You're right. They yeah. don't because it's, I mean, it's, it's hard enough as it is doing, yeah. you know, hundreds or, or whatever, a number of laps, but then having to get off the bike and run it, too. Yeah. You know, so. Uh, it just increases um, the likelihood of injury, too. It I does. Feel like every it time does. you hop off, every time you hop back on, you're just you're waiting for an ankle yeah. or something. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And so I'm thinking next year or not this next Southern event. I want to use the same exact format as I did in Oklahoma. Uh -huh. Um, um assuming that we do the next event yeah. it's, it's you know it's still in the air but but we we have a plan to do that but the next event i do want to offer a couple of additional classes i want to offer juniors mm -hmm. right and in order to do that i feel like we need to have ems on site yeah we probably need to strengthen up our waivers and maybe even talk about some other stuff you know that might make that more sure. more palatable for the for the park owner yeah. right and then also uh, i'd like to add a team event okay um but i want it on a different day Okay. So like like it would be like individuals one day, team the next day, um, make it a little more, you know, and, and not all the classes, literally. Team event is a team event, right? Yeah. Um, I'm still trying to decide whether I want m multiple riders on one bike or if I want to allow more than one that bike because, that, like, that's the – it's enduro, right? Yeah. yeah. It's not really enduro if you got five riders and five different bikes. That's not the same yeah. – I mean, it's still hard, but it's not the same thing. I kind of want to, like, like – Either it's one rider with a couple bikes or is, you know, but, uh, but yeah. Um, I yeah. mean, making that mini bike go for that many miles. I mean, that right there is a skill because you can't skill. just, yep. you know, rev it to, yep. the, to the limiter the whole time. So. Well, well, can we talk about Dave Sidoti? Okay. Right. So he builds this custom bike, which by the way, everybody that looks at his bike, if you haven't seen it, it's, it's, it's like a work of art, man. Yeah. Like it's amazing. If you looked at it, you'd think it was a KTM. Something, something <laughs> yes, made by KTM, exactly, right? It yeah. looks like a KTM, um, but uh, but it's a true mini bike. It started off as a Coleman, yeah. you know. I think a CT two hundred UX E. I think uh, yeah. you know it's a real mini bike. But he ran that bike the entire race. I don't. He had one lap. When I looked at his lap times, there was one lap that was a little longer, so he must have pitted. Mm. But as far as I can tell, he didn't break down the whole race. Nice. That was uh, and one of the few. There were a lot of bikes that made it the whole race, right? But most of them had some sort of a breakdown, a belt or a chain or whatever, right? And I'm pretty sure he didn't break down the whole time. Nice. And when he'd go by the timing booth, it didn't look like he was cruising. You watch Andrew Porter go by, that guy was blazing oh, past the yeah. timing booth. But Dave was making it up with good suspension, mm -hmm. riding skills, and, you know, and all of that. It's not all about necessarily how fast you go. It's about not having to pull out. Yeah. You know, not having to take those those pit times, you know, and definitely not breaking down on the trail. That's that's even worse because then you got to push your bike to the pit, right? <laughs> Ask David Rogers about that one. You don't have people yeah. pick them up in like a side by side. They really just got to push. If it. they're injured or if oh, they okay. can't make it, we'll pick them up. Yeah. But no, if if they want to stay in the race, they they got to get to the they got to get to the pit. That's yeah. that's the mm -hmm. kind of agreement that everybody had in the beginning was that you know if you break down out there, you can stay in the race, but you got to get your bike up to the pit. Yeah. You know. So. Tristan actually finished the race on pushing his bike across the. He was uh, he, did. he was down at, in Oklahoma yep. during the drag races, and he he was at the Lima Hundred as well, and he mm -hmm. finished the race pushing his bike across the finish line. Wow! And we we did have another racer. Um, I can't remember his name now, but he was running skinny tires, and he had oh, yeah. broken his whole handlebar assembly like really early on in the race. 
And he passed tech. I was like, do you feel safe with what you're doing, right? He's absolutely, uh, you know, ratchet straps oh and clamps. Goodness. And I mean, yeah. I felt, uh, it was solid, yeah. right? Like they had it on there good. He finished the whole race like that. Wow. And I actually, no, he, he got the underdog award. That's right. He got the underdog oh, award. Because, okay. I mean, like, if you finish a race with ratchet straps on your handlebars, yeah, that's, pretty amazing, right that's pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. so. Riding yeah. this Frankenstein bike. Exactly. <laughs> well, not only that, but, like, like it was like a CT100 with skinny tires on it. It was something like that, right? It was small bike, no suspension, skinny tires. I was what? like, man. <laughs> Mini biking ain't easy. Yeah, right? <laughs> so it's you, definitely easier on one of those big trail masters yeah. or something like that <laughs> than it is on, on a doodle bug, right? <laughs> so you're trying to expand that Line 100 weekend to a Saturday, Sunday? Because there's already uh, camping, right? Possibly, yeah. There is camping. And and I, I've got to thank the, the park owner, right? Blake runs an amazing park up there. It's, it's really inexpensive. You know, it's like $10 to get into the park. Per, it's per person, mm -hmm. but it's $10. It's pretty inexpensive. You can ride any way you want to. You can go anywhere you want to on the park. I hear it's an and amazing place. I've I've seen is, video yeah. footage. Of yeah, it's it's Red large, and, yeah. it's large, and you, uh, like whether you go out there with a side by side or a mini bike or a motorcycle or or a gambler car yeah. or a off a jeep or whatever, there's stuff for everybody to do. There's not a lot of rock crawling. It's mm -hmm. mostly mud and dirt, right? Yeah. So don't expect to go out there and do like some gnarly, you know, like yeah. real gnarly rock crawling like I do in my Lankers or in a, yeah. in a Jeep or whatever. <laughs> but you can go out there and have a great time, especially in like like side by sides. Those guys are just ripping it all over mm -hmm. that. And and then also the North Texas Rally Cross guys go out there regularly. Actually, Sunday after my event, they were out there. They had 36 drivers show up, oh, wow. which is like for a rally cross event, that's like that's huge, yeah. right? And because they're doing one lap at a time, okay, right? So yeah, they had some really good. Uh, some really good people out there. Nice. Shouts out to Blanton. Yep. <laughs> Fastest little racer in Texas, like for real. Um, Blanton Payne drives a, like a, I don't know, a 86 Honda Civic wagon. Oh, nice. And it is fast. Wow. And we, we, we kind of uh, lovingly uh, tease him about the front because he's got this plexiglass thing. We call it the fishbowl. Mm -hmm. It looks like a piece of plexiglass like a bot it, it literally gives him downforce wow. and he is the fastest guy on that track and actually i saw him post something the other day saying he was like the 199 ranked autocross driver in the nation right now Congrats. i don't know how that all works or how that comes together but i just saw the post so. It, so yeah right <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that it's not right. So I mean yeah I don't know. And I, I don't know. It sounds like I believe it. it sounds like he's absolutely good um so I guess the question we usually ask at the end is, where do you see mini bike racing and culture going? That's an awesome question. So, so before I started really promoting Lime this year, yeah. right? Before it was just grassroots. I'm talking to some people in some some mini bike groups and whatever, and I had a lot of help from the different groups. This year, I started actually like like doing social media, right? I'm Instagram and Facebook and whatever, paying for some ads, getting the name out there. And what I realized is that there are tons of mini bike groups in every state. There's tons of them, right? People don't realize it. And so, I mean, I'm pretty sure if you were to take 100 people in a room, there's a chunk of those that have mini bikes right now. And and so it's like the 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 kind of a silent and unknown like like uh, like closet sport. <laughs> so so I, I think there's a future for it for sure. I mean, you see people out there. I mean, it's kind of like the guys that used to ride around in the in the um, you know the bikes, right? The, you know with chains and all that. Stuff. Yeah, like yeah. you've got that style mini bike with the chrome and the gleam. You guys, the one that you guys just built was gorgeous. The right. one you guys just gave away, right? And then you, you've got the off road guys. You got the drag guys. I mean, there's a drag group up in Oklahoma right now. We've been talking back and forth a little bit. Those guys are doing amazing stuff up there, right? So, it's not small. It's huge. I don't know if it's even smaller than it was when it was booming in the 70s and 80s, yeah. you know, like like back in the day. Small bikes, I, big community. Small bikes, big community. I always tell people, and I don't know where I heard this the first time, but I, I've, I've got my Africa Twin. It's pretty fast, right? It's a full-size bike. It's pretty yeah. fast. Um, but I have more fun riding a slow bike fast than I do driving riding a fast bike slow, which is what you have to do most of the time you ride it, right? Yeah. So, uh, so every time I get out on the mini bike, I mean, it's just like I got to – I got a big grin on my face. I'm riding that track the other night with with uh, Kenny, who raced. By the way, um, Kenny is was one of the older 
racers at the at the event wearing the red, white, and blue helmet, riding a the only hurricane that was there, I believe. Okay, um, nice. Yeah, bought from GPS, I believe. So, but uh, I rode the, out there with Kenny. Like the whole time, I, I like I'd, I'd catch myself. I'd like. <laughs> I got this big grin on my face. I love it. It's fun, right? So, and and that's the thing that people don't get is, you know, they they spend all that money on side by sides. They're great, right? Or on high end dirt bikes. They're great, but the in the end, are they really more fun? I don't know. I don't know. There's a lot to be fun. A lot of fun to be had with these. Yeah. Oh no, absolutely. I think it's, is there something about the fact that you can just go full throttle yeah. on it. <laughs> Yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah, rip it. And you're not going to go super fast. No, I mean, but it feels like you are. Going 100 miles per hour. Or 25 or miles an hour on this or Coleman. 20, oh, my yeah. gosh. Yeah. But that was, like, the funnest <laughs> yeah. thing because it's such a tiny bike. It's such a tiny engine. When we hit 25, yep. we were all crunched down like, yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Because yeah. we no, the first pass, you were like, we hit 24, and we were like, I think you can go faster. And the fact that you were able to squeeze out that one oh, more yeah. is so <laughs> good. Oh, yeah. Oh, like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, I came down and picked up uh, some some parts to upgrade my Trailmaster oh, um, okay. a few months back, and and like when I hit forty six, I was like, yes, man, forty six <laughs> is awesome, man. I, I, like before, it was only at like thirty two or something like that with this yeah. stock setup. I wasn't getting yeah, yeah. the speed out of it. Had some problems with my clutch and whatever. And man, when I when I rebuilt it and put it back together, I was like, forty six. That is awesome, <laughs> man. I got to ask you, how do you feel about going 100 miles an hour on a mini bike? You know, it, it depends on how it's built. Mm. I mean, it really does. I don't have any problem going 100 miles an hour for sure. And I, I think with the right tires, the right suspension, and with, I mean, you want to keep your vibration a little lower than it would have to be on your typical mini bike. But yeah, I mean, fun. Imagine it's only about two feet from the ground, has no <laughs> suspension, has about 13-inch tall tires. Would you do it then on, a, like, a drag strip? Mm. So you got a quarter Maybe. mile just Maybe. to gun it it. It, it. it depends on how it's built. I mean, I'll be real. It depends on how it's built. I've seen some people riding little, little tiny mini bikes with, you know, drag bars and whatever. And, I mean, I like speed. So it's it's possible that I would. I'm kind of a big guy. I might need I might need one a little bit bigger because I'm six foot two. I don't know how I could yeah. like you know. I'd be like you know clown bike you know. I don't know how. But but if it was a little bigger you know, uh, it's not the speed that that concerns me. It's the vibration and mm -hmm. the you know, like Getting some speed yeah. wobbles over. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. exactly. You know, okay. you know, we've we've all seen uh, racers in different motor motorsports. You know, uh, you know, die from you know, like like in tra tragedy. You know, yeah. in 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 places that they shouldn't have, yeah. you know, things they've done a hundred times or a thousand times, you know? And, and so, uh, yeah, I think I'd want it to be a little bit taller than okay. that. <laughs> now, if you're offering though, <laughs> I mean, I, I might be convinced, okay. you know, <laughs> we do need a jockey at some point. I'm nice. Wondering. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that's all the time we have for all today. Right. We want to give you a big shout out. Thank you so much, Mark, for coming out and hanging out with us. Well, happy to be here, man. This was really cool. Is there a website that they can go see or of your Instagram? Just IG as or? easy as www.thelime100.com. Okay. Nice. And if you look up Lime 100 Racing on Facebook or Instagram, it'll be it'll pop right up. Okay, we'll do our part to also share as much as we can from the Lime from the Lime race. I appreciate been, that. Are the some of the few photos, still photos, they've just been popping off like crazy, and the yep. people want to see more and more. So we'll definitely they do. Keep they do, and I, I have some homework to do myself. I got the race yeah. results up today, nice. but I've got I've been traveling for work, and yeah. so I've got some stuff I need to put on the web. So, gotcha. so thank you so much. This has been a, a Mini Biking Ain't Easy podcast. Make sure to like, subscribe, and ride on. Oh, ride on. There we go. Oh, yeah, one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Which camera? Yeah. Yeah. All, of them. Yeah. All of them, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you killed it. Oh, thanks, Dad.